body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer, Joel, here with me as well. And today we're doing a highly requested topic and probably one of the most interesting just stories and things in history, period. Mm -hmm. And that is the absolutely insane life of David Koresh and the 1993 Waco siege. This one is both for me and Joel, a very, very interesting topic. Oh yeah. Um, I've been waiting to cover this one on this show for since we started because, you know, David Koresh and this whole story is just absolutely crazy. It really is. I mean, the talk about the ultimate manipulator, this guy's it, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. So if you haven't heard this, then get ready. This one's a wild, wild story. For sure. And I'm sure most of you guys have seen the the Waco series last year it was on, on Netflix. Netflix. And uh, yeah, I watched that too. And, you know, super good. And the actor who was David Koresh nailed it. Yeah. Like, so convincing and stuff. So, yeah, I'm, I was upset to see it's no longer on Netflix. Of course not. They took it down. And, I think it's on know. Paramount Plus now. Oh, okay. With all these damn streaming services. And I know. Everybody's trying to, like, hoard their hoard their content. Yeah, true. I think that's where it is now. But, yeah, that, that looked like a really, really good series. So, mm. if you're looking for a more visual representation of it. But, I mean, God, there's so much video footage yeah. of David Koresh and, obviously, the Siege at Waco. For sure. So, that's what we're going to be diving into today. Before we get into that, I want to remind everybody, I have a CBD company. If you're looking for just something to chill you out that's not going to get you high, then CBD is what you're looking for. My website is higherlovewellness.com. Everything is made, produced, grown right here in Colorado. There's no THC on any of the consumables, so you don't have to worry about failing drug tests or getting in trouble with the law because it's it's legal in all 50 states. Obviously, check with your local governments and some, you know, there's some cities and I think there's even a state or two where they have some restrictions with CBD, but for the most part, it's legal in all 50 states. And we've got gummies, we've got uh, oils, which are really good. We also have CBD wax, uh, which you can dab and you can also sprinkle over, you know, your other yes. greens, uh, which is really, really good stuff. So yeah, that's higherlovewellness.com. And we're actually going to be doing a 420 sale here coming up. Woohoo! And that sale is going to run for three days from 420 to 422. And it's going to be 20% off the whole site. Hell so, yeah. Really good stuff. Make sure you check it out. Uh, also, this episode is brought to you by Purple Candid CO Green Chef and Cat Person, which I'm very excited to tell you about that later on. But let's not waste any more time because we've got a lot of ground to cover with David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. So David Koresh, surprisingly... This was something that I didn't even know until researching this episode. He was actually born Vernon Wayne Howell, and he was born on August 17th, 1959 in Houston, Texas. His mother, Bonnie Sue Clark, was just 14 years old when she had him, very, very young. And he never actually met his father, Bobby Wayne Howell, because he actually ran off with some other teenage girl right after he was born. So clearly not a great guy. But when David was a baby... Bonnie started dating an abusive alcoholic who had just been released from prison. And then this abusive alcoholic moved in with him. And when she was 18, she sent David to live with her mother. She then came back for him in 1966 when he was six years old. And at that point, she had married a carpenter named Roy Haldeman, and they had a son named Roger together. David, growing up, liked to play outside and just be outside in general. And Bonnie said later that he always had neighborhood friends to play with. But... David would describe his childhood as being pretty lonely. He had dyslexia, which there wasn't much support for this in the education system at that point in time. So learning to read and write was very, very difficult for him. But he was a smart kid, nonetheless. He liked to take things apart in order to see how they worked, especially electronics. He actually taught himself how to fix different things, from lawnmowers to roof shingles. He knew how to take apart and fix anything. He also taught himself how to play the guitar. And when he was about 12 or 13 years old, he started listening to radio preachers and reading the Bible. And for a while, he actually wanted to be a rock star when he grew up. David Koresh, though, ended up dropping out of high school and never graduated. And in his early 20s, he started going to church. He actually went to a Baptist church where at some point while attending, he had a divine revelation and became a born-again Christian. 
He then went back to his mother's church, the Seventh-day Adventists. But when he was 19 years old, he was dating a 15-year-old girl named Linda, and her dad really liked David and actually let him stay at their house. But when Linda got pregnant, her father was furious, clearly that'd be a problem, and kicked David out. This devastated David. He was living out of his car and spending a lot of time in cemeteries praying for guidance. He also started visiting local preachers and asking questions about scripture. One day, while reading the Bible, he had another divine moment where he became convinced that the Holy Spirit was a large-breasted woman. God also told him he needed to have sex with the preacher's daughter at his church and impregnate her. And when he went and told the preacher this, this divine intervention he had had, they expelled him from the church. Not surprising at all. But now he's 22 years old and he decided, you know what? I need a new start. So he moved from Houston to Waco, Texas. And that's where he discovered this group that was this religious group that was meeting out there already called the Branch Davidians. The Branch Davidians were an offshoot from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is a Protestant church started in 1863. And followers are called Adventists because they believe the second coming of Jesus Christ or the second advent is near. And their day of worship is Saturday instead of Sunday, the seventh day of the week. And the founders of the church were a group of three men and one woman named Ellen Gold White. And Ellen's followers believed that she had the gift of prophecy and passed along messages from God in her writings, which are actually still used by the church today. In 1929, a member named Victor Howdiff wrote a book called The Shepherd's Rod that listed all the ways he felt the church needed to be reformed. But the leaders of the church viewed this work as heresy, and Victor was actually excommunicated in 1930. But after adding two more volumes to his work, him and his followers formed their own group in 1934 and called it The Shepherd's Rod, or just The Rod. They then bought land in Axtell, Texas, a rural community about 13 miles outside of Waco. And that's where they built a commune or a compound called Mount Carmel. In 1942, the group decided to change its name to the Davidians. Because in the Bible, Jesus is a descendant of King David. And the Davidians believe they're helping prepare for the return of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And they focus mainly on interpreting symbolic prophecy from scripture and they believed in a healthy lifestyle, emphasizing marriage, family, education, and prayer. It didn't take long until they had about 100,000 members, and in 1955, their leader, Victor Howdiff, died unexpectedly. And there was a power struggle, and the group split into several subgroups. The main one was led by Victor's wife, Florence, and she told the group that Victor had predicted Christ's return on April 22nd, 1959. But there was another guy, named Benjamin Roden, who came forward and said, you know what, I'm the true prophet. And God told me that Victor's prediction is wrong and that, you know what, I should be the new leader of the group. So Benjamin and his followers left the Davidians and formed yet another offshoot, the Branch Davidians, which is a reference to the branch, a symbolic figure in the Old Testament. In 1959, Victor Howdoff's prediction for the second coming of Jesus Christ didn't happen. And the Davidians started to turn on his widow Florence and decided, you know what? We want to go and follow Benjamin Rodin and the Branch Davidians instead. So Benjamin took over the compound known as Mount Carmel in 1962, and it became the official headquarters of the Branch Davidians. He then bought up more of the surrounding land, and a few years later, they actually expanded the whole compound. Benjamin ended up dying in 1978, and his wife Lois took over as the next Branch Davidian prophet. But their son, George Roden, was a powerful leader in the group, and a lot of members believed he was the true prophet that should be following, not Lois. With so much uncertainty surrounding the Branch Davidians, you know, Lois is taken over, but she's really, you know, everybody's not really wild about her. This is when David Koresh kind of enters the scene. So David Koresh actually changed his name when he really started getting into you know, religion and the Bible, and especially around this time, he realized, you know what? I consider myself like a prophet. I consider myself like, 
you know, a descendant or an incarnation of a Persian king, which Koresh is actually the biblical name of Cyrus the Great, who was a Persian king and is named as a Messiah for freeing Jews during the Babylonian captivity. And obviously David from the Bible as well. So it makes sense that he would call himself this type of prophetic name. So David Koresh actually moves to Waco in 1981, just a few years after Lois has started running the Branch Davidians. He kind of just slid into the group and started, you know, participating with everybody else. He played the guitar and sang in church services. And overall, he was well liked by other members and he made himself right at home. By 1983, his divine revelations returned and he started telling other group members about messages he received from God, which really kind of, you know, when you start saying you're receiving messages from God and people are believing you, I mean, it instantly kind of raises your power in this group. What's interesting too is that he was also having an affair with Lois Roden. He claimed God told him to have a child with her, even though Lois Roden was now in her late 60s. So he said that, you know, if we have this child, it would be the chosen one. Lois is sleeping with Koresh, so she says, all right, you want some more power in the group? You can start preaching your message. So he did, and he called it the Serpent's Root, which is one of his servants. And we'll play a clip of that for you now. And the horn of my salvation, my high tower, I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Solomon says, all is vanity. But Solomon says, look, young man, fear God in the days of your youth, before the evil days draw nigh, when you'll have no pleasure in them, before the sun, moon, stars is darkened. Once he started giving sermons, this is when he really started getting the Branch Davidians' attention, and people really started gravitating toward him and really listening to what David had to say. The other person that did not like this, though, was George Roden. He believed that he was the chosen one and God, he already had to compete with his own mother. So he didn't need this other self-proclaimed prophet getting, you know, all the attention. But David claimed that God told him that he should marry a 14 year old girl named Rachel Jones. And the parents just gave permission and they got married. And it was actually on his trip to Israel where David actually had a vision that apparently told him that he was, like I mentioned earlier, Cyrus the Great. This figure in the Old Testament chosen by God to free the Jews from the Babylonians. He was also called God's anointed one or Messiah. And he really felt like he was the savior and that really his role in the Branch Davidians was to, you know, fulfill the prophecy and restore the Davidic kingdom. But in order to do this, he believed he had to do this from the U.S. So he actually left Israel and went back to Texas. In 1986, Lois Roden died and George took complete control of the group. And obviously there was a huge clash between his followers and David's followers. And George ended up forcing David and his people out of Mount Carmel at gunpoint. And with nowhere to go, they lived in buses and tents in Palestine, Texas, about 90 miles away. While living there, they had no running water or electricity. But during the two years in exile, David was still able to attract more followers from California, England, Australia, and even Israel, which makes sense. I mean, I'm sure he was saying that, you know, this is a part of the, the, you know, the prophecy. This is part of what we have to fulfill. You know, we're exiled just like the Jews were exiled. I mean, it, right. it honestly like played out perfectly into his kind sure. of master plan. And David was so good at winning the people over. I mean, his things he talks about so convincing and he knew the Bible so well inside and out that he was able to just quote scripture yeah. just on the spot and ways to relate that with, uh, you know, his followers situations or things as yeah. a whole. And that's really what allowed him to like convince these people that right. he is the Messiah or, or yeah, you know, that's a great point is that his biblical knowledge was like unreal beyond anybody, especially in this group's capacity. Like, from a young age, I know he memorized the uh, New Testament yeah, first, for and sure. then he memorized the Old Testament. So he literally had the whole Bible memorized. I mean, yeah. That's impressive. But then on top of memorizing the Bible, he's able to use that and then manipulate the scripture right, undetectably right. because people are just like, damn, he's just quoting this Bible. Like, 
Who's going to question him? Who's going to question that? his knowledge on that? Right. So he clearly knows more than I do. So yeah. I guess I have to listen to what he says. W- which gave him all that power and control, essentially. Yeah, it really so. did. I mean, it's really smart and it makes you really think and believe that he probably had this whole plan kind of in motion from way, way earlier than even arriving to Mount Carmel, which is really yeah. interesting. Like he he kind of knew, maybe he really did like kind of foresee the future and he was kind of psychic in a way and he knew that he was going to end up leading this group of of followers, mm-hmm. you know, the Branch Davidians. So very, very interesting. But while they were kind of living out in this camp, David's mother, Bonnie, came to visit a few times. And while she was there, she remembered David's followers as lovely, hardworking people. So while David's exiled, I mean, he's gaining more and more followers. George, on the other hand, was tired of losing followers to David and actually challenged him to a bizarre duel. He said, whoever could raise a corpse from the dead was the true prophet and rightful leader of the Branch Davidians. So in order to make this happen, George dug up a corpse to resurrect. And David instead went to the police and reported him for illegally exhuming a body. And he actually gave them a picture of the casket as proof. The police, however, wanted a picture of the actual corpse. So David and seven of his followers broke into Mount Carmel to get the picture. They were armed for protection. And when they were caught by George's men, there was a big shootout. The police then were called in order to come and break it up, and they found George stuck behind a tree. He had actually been shot and had other minor injuries. David and his followers were arrested and charged with attempted murder. The women who had followed him brought their kids to the courthouse and actually watched the proceedings through the door. David and his followers, though, were acquitted after proving they were trying to get the evidence the police had asked for. George, on the other hand, had been arrested and charged with illegally exhuming the body, and his case ended in mistrial and no one actually served any jail time for this. After he was released, George had more competition from another supposed prophet, a man named Wayman Dale Adair. And he said he was a true Messiah and chosen one, and he should be the one leading the Branch Davidians. So on August 5th, 1989, George attacked Wayman with an ax and actually murdered him. And instead of being charged with murder, they hauled him off to a psychiatric hospital because they thought he was insane. Mount Carmel was rented out and all the Branch Davidians were displaced with nowhere to go and no leader to follow anymore. David also found out that George owed thousands of back taxes on the compound and his followers raised the money and they were able to move back in after they got those taxes paid. But also before they could move in, they had to get rid of the current tenants who were running a meth lab on the property. David actually kicked them all out and called the police in in order to remove the meth lab. How crazy is that? I mean, who would have known that like at one point Mount Carmel had a meth lab in it? Yeah, I would have never guessed. Some (laughs) breaking bad shit going on. Yeah. In August 1989, David released a new tape called New Light. He explained he was ordered by God to procreate with his female followers to build the new kingdom. He needed to have 24 children who would become the 24 elders around God's throne, which is actually referenced in the book of Revelation in the Bible. And his children would rule the kingdom after the second coming of Jesus Christ. David believed he was chosen by God and a modern prophet and a Messiah, but he didn't really claim to be Jesus Christ, which he was accused of. So in order to have these 24 kids, he needed a lot of wives. So he made multiple couples in the group divorce so he could marry their women. How crazy is that? Yeah, that is crazy. And and this is where, you know, you start questioning his motive you know and uh-huh. you start questioning well why did he just start marrying all these women was it because god told him to or was it because david's you know wants to have sex with all these women and he's right. using his taking advantage of his power to fulfill sure. his own you know personal desires but i think it was also a control tactic as well it allows him to take control of these women and it also allows him to control these men whose wives he just took so the men and all the women who weren't married were then required to be celibate. And he was the only man allowed to have sex and procreate. He basically gave himself special privileges and forced everyone else to sacrifice, which is a common tactic used by fake religious leaders or cult leaders. David ended up fathering 18 children, falling short of his goal of 24. David was extremely charismatic, a very welcoming leader, who actively recruited new members on his travels around the world. But when he took over the group, a lot of people left. And former members have spoken out against his teachings and how he ran the group. They said he was controlling and made it hard for people to leave. 
and a lot of them obviously disagreed with his polygamy and marrying underage girls. David was only legally married to his first wife, Rachel Jones, and they had three kids. But he had many more children with women and girls he also considered his wives. In the state of Texas, if two people agree to marry and then live together like husband and wife, they have a common law marriage. And he ran into trouble when the local police found out not all of his common law wives were legal adults, as several of them were under 18 years old. And in 1992, a six-month investigation was led by the Child Protection Services in order to determine if any underage girls at Mount Carmel were being sexually abused. But the age of consent in Texas is actually 14, as long as the parents give permission for the girls to marry. So the investigation found that all of David's underage wives had parental permission. Investigators also considered trying to charge him with bigamy, which is basically multiple marriages. If you're already married in one marriage and you go and seek out another marriage, I guess that's considered bigamy. But he had only legally married his first wife, who was an adult. So he kind of skirted around this charge as well. But it was a complicated situation. And in the end, they decided that they couldn't prove David had done anything wrong. Plus, there was no proof that any of these girls or women were being forced to do anything. So investigators dropped the case. But the next trouble for David came all the way from Australia, where a group of Branch Davidians had settled. They accused David and his followers of child abuse, but not sexual abuse. In February of 1992, Child Protection Services investigated again. All the kids and adults denied these claims and said kids were highly valued in their religion and well taken care of. The only proof of abuse they found was that the kids were spanked as punishment. Although adults weren't allowed to do this while angry, And if they didn't follow this rule, David would discipline the adult and not the child. Plus, this was the 90s, so spanking kids was an accepted form of punishment. And for a few months, investigators did surprise visits to Mount Carmel to check on the kids. But during their visits, they found no proof of abuse. And again, the investigation was closed in April 1992. The Branch Davidians needed to bring in about $15,000 per month to pay for the compound and the living expenses for all the members. Some members had regular jobs to contribute to the compound. One guy helped bring in a significant amount of money by selling guns, ammunition, and gear at gun shows. Some of the female members were talented seamstresses, and they even made a custom line of clothing called David Koresh Survival Wear in order to sell at these gun shows. The clothes were basically costumes, though, and the women sewed on dummy grenades in order to add flair. In June of 1992, a UPS driver noticed something that looked like grenades in a package being delivered to the compound, and he reported it to the police, which then led to an investigation by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or the ATF. On July 30, 1992, ATF agents questioned a gun dealer who did business with the Branch Davidians. That summer, David had actually bought a ton of legal semi-automatic AR-15 rifles, as well as other devices that they could modify them into to make them military M16 rifles, which would essentially make them fully automatic. The gun dealer told the agents that David Koresh bought and sold weapons as a source of income for the group. And before the agents left, he snuck away to call David and warn him. But he wasn't phased at all. David actually told the dealer to, you know what, have the agents come out, take a look at Mount Carmel and look for themselves. The gun dealer then offered the phone to one of the agents and said David was happy to talk and that they could come out there and inspect his inventory at any time. However, the agent refused to take the phone, and they didn't go to the compound that day. The county sheriff also told the ATF agents to go check out the compound and talk to David directly, but they never did. At the time, the agents knew the semi-automatic weapons David bought from the gun dealer were completely legal, but he had converted some of them into fully automatic weapons. But that wasn't the issue. Automatic weapons were legal, but highly regulated. And David hadn't filed the proper paperwork for these weapons yet. He needed to get a permit and pay a registration fee. And the punishment for not doing so was just paying some fines. And that was it. But the ATF was convinced he was stockpiling illegal weapons and preparing the group for something major. During a congressional inquiry in 1995, the ATF officials were asked why they didn't go to inspect the weapons when David invited them. The agent said that no reasonable person would show them the illegally modified weapons. So they didn't check it out because they just assumed that David wouldn't cooperate. A few ATF agents went undercover as college students and actually moved into an old farmhouse near the compound. 
but their cover wasn't really convincing. They said they were philosophy students at a local technical college, and all the agents were in their 30s or 40s, all dressed in expensive clothes and driving nice cars. Pretty easy to give them away. Oh, yeah. But when the Branch Davidians chatted with them about the campus, none of them could describe what the campus looked like. One of the agents, however, showed interest in joining the Branch Davidians in order to get closer to David. And during one conversation, he somehow let it slip that he was an undercover agent. This didn't really surprise the group members as they had already figured out that these guys were agents for themselves. And they knew that pretty much immediately yeah. once they moved in. Yeah, these guys did a horrible job at a cover story and not even having the background info for their cover story. Right. And it wasn't even David who first came up to the house. Like he made one of his wives bring some bakery goods to their front door and give them like a welcoming gift. And that's when she knew like, okay, no way. They're, they're, these guys aren't college no kids way. living out here. Yeah. Like, they're clearly here to surveil you, David. Like, yeah, I mean, D David's obviously very intelligent and mm -hmm. he knew like he was always like a few steps ahead of the ATF. Absolutely. Like. like he already knew that he had to watch for it. He knew what was coming. Like by sure. doing all, that's why he was so confident in, you know, when he spoke is like he knew exactly what was yeah. going to happen. And again, I guess this comes back to being this messiah you know like for sure all knowing and even though he knew they were undercover david still like went through the actions being super kind to him right. and that made one of the undercover officers open up to david and trust david and because boom that's when they got the info they needed yep. to confirm oh you guys are the atf right this agent also brought illegal weapons to mount carmel to show the group members hoping they admit they had some too but instead, the members told him those weapons were illegal, and you know you got to get rid of them. He also reported to the higher ups at the ATF that he couldn't find any evidence of illegal weapons or any other illegal activity at the compound. Later, however, he claimed the ATF lied to the public about the group. According to the prophecy, the Branch Davidians would be attacked by a corrupt government and maybe even martyred. And David obviously knew that they were being surveilled by now, and he was starting to believe that the ATF would fulfill this prophecy in a violent attack. So from here, this is where things start to kind of turn for the worst. But before we continue, I want to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. You shouldn't need a PhD to figure out what's in your cat's food. That's why Cat Person makes it easy to keep your cat healthy and happy. Without complicated names or confusing labels, just high quality, high protein meals made for cats and the people who love them. I actually have three cats, so I was super happy to give them another food to try. I've been giving them the foods from the stores and they seem to like that okay, but it's obviously not the best for them. So the first thing that I gave them was some chicken shreds and broth because one of my cats, Tucker, actually loves the broth. Like that's the first thing he does is lick up all the broth whenever we give him wet food. And I got to say, he absolutely loves this shit. Like he literally now at night, he begs for the food he comes and jumps on top of me basically smacks me around he'll just sit at the door waiting for me to come downstairs and feed him you and your cat are going to love cat person as much as we do go to catperson.com lights out and use code lights out to save five dollars off your starter box with free shipping your starter box includes 10 cups of wet food one bag of dry food and an entire set of serving spoons silicone lids and a scooper how awesome is that that's catperson.com lights out Code lights out for $5 off your starter box with free shipping. Check out catperson.com slash lights out and make sure you use code lights out. I don't know about you, but I love to eat. I also love to cook. So meal kits are really the perfect thing for me. I've got a busy schedule. I don't have time to go to the grocery stores. And that's where meal kits like Green Chef really come in handy. And if you didn't know, Green Chef is actually now owned by HelloFresh and they have a wider array of meal plans to choose from. So there's something for everyone. What's different about Green Chef is that it's the first USDA certified organic meal kit company. So you get to enjoy clean ingredients you can trust, seasonally sourced for peak freshness. Green Chef also makes it super easy and affordable with plans to fit every lifestyle, whether you're keto, you're paleo, you're vegan, you're vegetarian, or you're just looking to eat a little bit healthier. There's a range of recipes to suit every diet or preference. I absolutely love meal kits. We use them a lot because we just don't have time to go to the grocery store, plus I end up, whenever I do make meals from the grocery store, I end up making way too much food, and so much of it goes to waste. If you want to check out Green Chef today, go to greenchef.com slash 90lightsout and use code 90lightsout to get $90 off, including free shipping. 
Again, check out Green Chef today at greenchef.com slash 90 lights out and make sure you use that code 90 lights out to get $90 off, including free shipping. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. So things really started to take a dark turn in August of 1992 when the Branch Davidians and the rest of the public learned about some very shady actions that the ATF did. That month, there was an 11 day standoff at a place called Ruby Ridge in Idaho between ATF agents and a man named Randy Weaver, who was a white nationalist. They'd actually tricked Randy into selling illegal weapons and then charged him with the goal of forcing him to be a source inside the white supremacy movement. They actually went to Ruby Ridge with an arrest warrant, but Randy refused to come out. Inside of his home was his wife, his four kids, and a family friend. When ATF agents tried to serve this warrant, a gunfight broke out. And I think there's still some cloudiness around who actually shot the first bullet. But the result was Randy's son was shot and killed. And this then started the 11 day siege. A sniper actually shot and wounded the family friend and Randy when he was trying to get to his son's body. This sniper also shot and killed Randy's wife while she was standing in the doorway holding their baby. The Branch Davidians were not white nationalists and actually didn't like Randy Weaver. But when they found out the government attacked him at his home with his wife and kids and that multiple people were killed, they were super freaked out by it, and rightfully so. At Ruby Ridge, the agents had used surveillance techniques and low-flying helicopters and caught people off guard with hidden snipers. It was all really alarming and scary for the Branch Davidians who were also being surveilled by the federal government. They also knew the government had essentially tricked Randy into breaking the law in order to just give them an excuse to arrest him, which led to the attacking and killing of his family. The Branch Davidians wondered amongst themselves if this had been a dress rehearsal for a potential attack on Mount Carmel. When the ATF started flying helicopters around their compound, the members really started to worry. David tried to defuse the situation by reaching out to the local police, and he kept in touch with Child Protection Services in order to just cover all of his bases. But on February 25th, 1993, the ATF brought a signed affidavit to a judge in order to apply for a search warrant of Mount Carmel. This affidavit was written by the same agent who refused to go to Mount Carmel to inspect the weapons when David invited them, and it had a lot of problems. The affidavit mentioned that a neighbor had reported hearing machine gun fire on the compound. This was true, but it left out that the local police checked it out actually and found that the noise was made by a toy. It also mentioned things that weren't under the jurisdiction of the ATF, like polygamy and drugs. The affidavit also tried to link David to a known drug offender by talking about the meth dealer who used to live at Mount Carmel. They left out that this guy was kicked out as soon as the Branch Davidians returned and that the police were called right away to remove the meth lab. The affidavit even misquoted federal law, but they got the search warrant anyway for Mount Carmel to look for guns, explosives, and related paraphernalia. This was a standard search warrant that needed to be served to the residents of the compound, not a no-knock warrant where they could just bust in. The very next day, Islamic fundamentalists bombed the World Trade Center in New York City and a bunch of ATF agents had to be sent there to investigate. So the Mount Carmel search was called off. The head of the ATF, however, convinced officials the search should continue as scheduled, but they were only authorized to serve the warrant if they had an element of surprise. If David was tipped off, their orders were to stand down. Key, stand down. On Saturday, February 27th, the Waco newspaper published the first article in a series called The Sinful Messiah, which was about David Koresh. His face is plastered on the front of the newspaper. They also printed the charges against David and demanded law enforcement take action, which only put more pressure on the ATF to get David into custody. The Branch Davidians saw the story and realized an attack was imminent. On Sunday, February 28th, a member of the commune who worked as a mail carrier saw the ATF agents coming and warned David. One of these fake philosophy students, aka undercover agents, heard that David knew the attack was happening that day. He then drove up the road flashing his lights, the secret signal to call off the search because they didn't have the element of surprise. But they didn't call it off, and they didn't knock on the door to serve the warrant. Instead, a mile-long line of cattle trucks filled with more than 150 ATF agents drove to the compound. There were 80 vehicles in total, and they were joined by news reporters as well. The plan was to do a dynamic entry 
They would park the trucks in front of the door, and agents would all jump out at once, and then break down the door with a battering ram. There would also be armed agents and three helicopters that could shoot into the compound from above if things turned violent. And the official name of the operation was Showtime. Very odd name. Even with all this careful planning, there were no ambulances or medical personnel standing by in case there were injuries. While the trucks were still coming down the road, David came to the door and stepped outside. He wasn't even armed. The armed agents then jumped out of the trucks early and ran toward him and they yelled, search warrant, get down. And this is obviously not the proper way to serve a standard search warrant, but the ATF claimed it was enough warning to consider the warrant served. David shut the door as soon as he saw him running at him and went inside. And the agents claimed that the Davidians then started firing at them through the door. But the Davidians claimed David shut the door because the agents were already firing at them and there were women and children inside. Either way, both sides started firing shots, and this gunfight went on for hours. Four ATF agents and five Branch Davidians were killed, and 16 agents and five Davidians were wounded. Three of the Davidians who were killed weren't part of the gunfight at all and weren't even armed. One guy was shot by an agent in the helicopter while he was doing chores outside. Another guy was just eating breakfast. David was actually shot twice, once in the hand and once in the hip. He was unconscious for hours, and the members were sure he was dying. At some point, he called his mother and told her he was dying, but he'd be back soon. After a ceasefire was negotiated, the 51-day siege began. The media tried to start piecing together what happened and how four agents ended up dead. And in order to really transport you to this whole thing, because it was really, really big on TV, I'm going to play a couple clips of the news reports now. Good evening, friends. It has been over 36 hours now since federal agents first confronted a heavily armed religious cult near Waco. They were met by a hail of gunfire, killing four of the agents and wounding over a dozen others. The ATF then brought in the FBI to take command, and they started trying to negotiate with David, who had somewhat recovered from his gunshot wounds. The authorities were afraid that this was a repeat of the 1978 Jonestown massacre, which is where Jim Jones orchestrated the mass murder-suicide of over 900 followers. So the FBI brought in the hostage rescue team headed by Dick Rogers. And this was the same guy who headed off the standoff at Ruby Ridge. And along with him, they brought a negotiation team. And these two groups disagreed on strategy. Dick Rogers wanted to be aggressive and try to force a surrender. But the negotiation team wanted to keep things civil. And right away, they got several kids from the inside the compound using the civil strategy. All the kids and adults inside claimed that they weren't hostages. They were all free to go if they wanted to. So the team focused on getting the kids out first in case things turned violent again. On the second day of the siege, March 1st, David told the negotiation team he wanted to make a nationwide broadcast. And after that, they would all surrender peacefully. He said he wanted to talk about the book of Revelation, which is about the apocalypse. And they asked him point blank if he was planning a Jonestown stunt, and he said no. The negotiation team came back with a counteroffer, which would allow him to submit a recorded message that they could review before airing. And at the start of the message, they told him to say that after it aired, he would peacefully surrender. And David agreed to these terms. David then recorded the sermon, and it was reviewed by the authorities and religious scholars and approved. And the Christian Broadcasting Network aired this sermon. So here's a clip of that. My name is Dave Koresh. I'm speaking to you from Mount Carmel Center. The first thing that I would like to introduce in our subject is the reasons for the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, commentary states that what John has after this sermon aired, they started to organize the surrender of the 20 children, 47 women, and 43 men still inside. They actually brought buses in, and the hostage rescue team was standing by to load them up one small group at a time. They were told not to be aggressive because the rest of the members would be watching. But unfortunately, no one came out. Authorities then called back the inside man and asked what was going on, and he said they were having trouble getting David on a stretcher, and that his gunshot wounds were pretty bad. They waited some more, and nothing happened. 
and after a few more phone calls, they found out David wanted to give a Bible study class before sending people out. Then he delayed again, saying the Lord spoke to him and told him to wait. Which, this was just frustrating. The FBI agents and Dick Rogers on the hostage rescue team was furious. And he wanted to punish David and teach him a lesson. On the other hand, the negotiation team wanted to take things slow, continue to build up trust with David, and try to get more people out of the compound. But the higher-ups wouldn't take a side, so they told both teams to move forward, which this just caused chaos. The negotiation team's approach was working. They were getting people out a few at a time, but each time they made progress, Dick's team came in and started messing with the Davidians. At one point, they even drove tanks, Abram tanks, into the compound to intimidate them, which violated the terms of the ceasefire. And right after the negotiations team gave the Davidians milk for the babies in the compound, Dick's team went and turned off the electricity. And then they started using tactics of psychological warfare. They started shining high-powered lights into the compound and blasting loud music and random sounds all night long. These random sounds included sirens, shrieking seagulls, bagpipes, the screams of strangled rabbits, babies crying, Christmas carols, and the song, These Boots Were Made For Walking, over and over again. And again, the tanks were driven all over the compound, destroying property and removing fuel tanks and even an old bus. And while David watched from the compound, a tank ran over his fully restored classic car, completely flattening it. They were clearly sending a message the only reason to destroy this property was to show David that they were angry. They also ran a tank back and forth over the grave of one of the Davidians killed in the gunfight. The agents around the compound started mooning the people inside and flipping them off even. The negotiation team tried to explain that if they were sending people out, they needed to reward them, not punish them. So far, they had gotten 35 people out and believed they could get the rest by showing respect and using positive reinforcement. But Dick Rogers and the hostage rescue team disagreed. They wanted to smoke them out. Inside the compound, the Davidians were getting paranoid that the authorities were planning an even more violent attack. The local media reported on the standoff in real time, which only added pressure to law enforcement to get the people out of the compound and arrest David. David then said that God had spoken to him again. In the book of Revelation, there is a scroll with seven seals and God told him that he was the one who could break them. David interpreted this as God telling him to write down the meaning of the seven seals. Basically, God had given him a task, and once that task was done, the waiting was over, and him and the rest of the Davidians could leave Mount Carmel. David sent a message to his lawyer explaining the plan. He said he was working day and night, dictating the message to his followers who were typing it out for him. He told the FBI that as soon as he was done, he'd come out and they could arrest him but the FBI wasn't buying it. They thought it was just another delay tactic. They even tried to get his mother, Bonnie, to go into the compound and talk to him into surrendering. Bonnie said it wouldn't work, though. God had told David to wait multiple times during his life, and even if there was somewhere they needed to be, if God told him to wait, he wouldn't go. At some point, the FBI asked David and his followers to make a videotape of what was happening inside the compound, and the members who spoke on the video seemed fine and unharmed. Here's a clip of that. We have no one telling the world our side, watching the lies that the federal agents have told. It's astounding. And before you judge us, make sure your own life is clean. Sleep is one of the most important things in life, and it's something we spend a whole lot of time doing. But are you getting the most comfortable sleep of your life? Well, if you haven't tried the Purple Mattress or any of the Purple products, then you're absolutely missing out. Purple mattresses and purple pillows actually have the purple pillow, and I absolutely love it. And the reason why is because purple has completely reinvented comfort. Only purple has the grid, a stretchy gel material that's amazingly supportive for your back and legs, or your shoulders and neck and hips. I don't know how they do it, but it's absolutely fantastic. Because of how it's designed, the grid doesn't trap air. Air actually circulates and flows through it, so you'll never overheat. The Purple Pillow has been a game changer for me and definitely has improved my sleep. Purple really is comfort for an uncomfortable world. And right now you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. Just go to purple.com slash lights out 10 and use promo code lights out 10. That's purple.com slash lights out 10. Make sure you use promo code lights out 10 
for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Again, that's purple.com slash lights out 10. Make sure you use code lights out 10. Terms do apply. Unhappy with your smile? You don't have to be. Thousands of people have used Candid, the clear, comfortable, removable, and practically invisible aligners to help straighten their teeth. And now they love their smile. And Candid is here to help straighten your teeth so you can fall in love with your smile too. Your treatment is prescribed and closely monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. You'll have the same quality of care you'd get from an in-office orthodontist from the comfort and convenience of your own home. The average candid treatment is just six months and you'll start seeing results way before then. And it costs thousands less than traditional braces. It really is an easy process. They send you a kit to take your molds and then they shortly after send you your aligners all the way through your entire plan, which is super convenient. So become your best you. Start straightening your teeth today, and right now you can save $75 off Candid Starter Kit. Go to CandidCO.com slash lights out and use code lights out. That's CandidCO.com slash lights out and use code lights out. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. Again, that's CandidCO.com slash lights out and make sure you use code lights out. So on April 19th, one of David's followers brought the FBI agents a disc that contained a portion of the manuscript he was working on. In four days, David had written out the interpretation of the first of the seven seals, but there was still a long way to go. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., Bill Clinton's new attorney general, Janet Reno, was briefed on the situation in Waco. The attorney general is in charge of the FBI, so when to end the siege was her call. She was appointed on March 12th, a few weeks into the siege. She had to rely on other people in order to tell her what was happening at Mount Carmel. She actually met with President Clinton and gave him her recommendation on why and how to end the siege. She explained the FBI's top reasons for why they had to act now. First, there is a limit to the resources needed to maintain the siege, and they were running out. Second, this type of thing had never happened before, and experts were convinced no more progress could possibly be made. And third, the danger of the Davidians harming themselves or others would only increase with time. And finally, the FBI believed the kids still inside the compound were being abused and forced to live in unsanitary and unsafe conditions. Janet Reno was never told about David's manuscript and his promise to surrender once it was done. She also wasn't given proof that the kids inside were being abused. So they decided to use tear gas instead of gunfire in order to force the Davidians out. The agents would stay safely inside the armored tanks and under no circumstances would they be authorized to fire their guns even if the Davidians opened fire on them? They would be completely protected by the tanks. The tanks were also equipped with boom lifts that would be used to make holes in the outside walls of the compound, and then they would spray tear gas into those holes. The plan was to just spray small amounts of tear gas slowly over two days, and if that didn't work, they'd shoot cans of tear gas into the compound in order to flush them out. On April 19th at 6 a.m., the FBI woke up the Davidians using the loudspeakers around the compound. They announced a plan, reassuring the members that they weren't being attacked. They were just making holes in the walls for the tear gas, and the tear gas wouldn't harm them. But the siege was over, and it was time to surrender. Once the plan started, they made holes and started spraying the tear gas. The adults in the compound put on gas masks, and they didn't have any masks for the kids. So they ended up soaking cloth and water for the kids to hold over their faces. And because they had these gas masks, no one came out. And when no one came out, the FBI agents immediately abandoned the plan. Instead of taking three days, they sprayed all of the tear gas into the compound at once and launched the cans. They then used the tanks to start tearing down the outside wall. The Davidians frantically tried to call the agents, but the phone lines were destroyed by the tanks. And with no other way to communicate, Around 9 a.m., the Davidians hung a banner outside saying they needed the phone fixed. And this is when things just absolutely got out of control. And I've got to play some of the news footage of this time because it's just absolutely insane. Parts of the building have collapsed. The fire has indeed engulfed the vast majority of this compound that has been the Bonnie, site. the entire roof is gone. The entire roof is gone. Mike, what else can you yes. tell us? Any uh, sign of firefighting equipment? I know. No. None whatsoever, and uh, there, there's our shot from, uh, you'll remember, Bonnie, what we refer to as farm cam. That's looking 
uh, from the north side into the compound. Uh, apparently the uh, north side is, is not involved yet, but it appears the rest of the compound is filled with uh, that orange fire and acrid uh, black smoke. There were wind speeds of up to 30 miles per hour that day, and wind coming in from the torn down walls only made it worse. Also, because there's fire and there was ammunition inside the compound, that started exploding as well. And a few of the Davidians ran out, but most were still inside. Fire trucks arrived about 20 minutes later, but they were stopped at the road at the FBI checkpoint and not allowed through. There was a huge explosion in the compound at 1225 and more walls collapsed. And the media was covering this fire live on TV. At 1243, the fire trucks finally made it, but they were too late. Less than an hour after the fire started, the compound was destroyed. The fire is probably the biggest controversy with this whole story. A lot of people believe that it was actually, you know, the federal authorities that started the fire because they were, you know, just in a hurry to get this over. So they thought that if we light a fire here, you know, a small fire, that that's going to force everybody out because tear gas doesn't work. But if people start breathing in smoke, then maybe they'll actually come out. But on the other side, the government completely denies this. And they said that it was the Branch Davidians that started the fire. Right. And that is the biggest question in this story. And there is videos on YouTube claiming that one of the tanks had a flamethrower on it, you know, approached one of the walls and you know, yeah. set the place yeah. on fire. But then again, you know, David Koresh and his suicide pact, uh, essentially, or his book of revelations that he was able to convince yeah. his followers that. You know, we're going down. With this is this. an apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is the, this is judgment day. I mean, this is right. the whole thing happening like I've mm -hmm. prophesized about right now. And that's, and to him, this was a chance to be a martyr as well. Uh -huh. And, you know, unfortunately, the Davidians went down with him. Right. I think a few people ran out, but the still the vast majority stayed by David's side because they were all convinced that what David was saying was true. Right. Right. And only nine Davidians made it out alive. And sadly, all of the children were still inside as the fire ravaged through the building and everybody perished. 76 Davidians in total died in the fire, including David Koresh, his legal wife, Rachel, their three kids and a total of 12 of David's kids, as well as two of his wives who were pregnant. And they actually had stillborn babies during the fire. The bodies of at least 17 kids were identified, but some were never recovered because they were literally incinerated by the fire. According to the government, no FBI agents fired any weapons during the siege, and it was the Davidians who started the fire on purpose in order to commit suicide. But the surviving Davidians said the agents were firing at them, and that the fire was set by the FBI agents either on accident or on purpose. This whole siege was so controversial. I mean, Obviously, the government, FBI, saying that, no, this was the Branch Davidians, but I, I would say a majority of people and the public really believe that the FBI, the ATF, the government was at fault for what, how this actually ended up mm -hmm. with all of these innocent people being incinerated in this fire. Because again, during the final day of the siege, the FBI claimed that their agents never fired any weapons and that the agents were ordered to stay inside the armored tanks. So there was no reason to shoot, even if the Davidians shot first. But over the speakers, they threatened, do not shoot at us or we will shoot at you. With agents safely inside the armored tanks, there is no reason to make this threat other than to scare or intimidate the Davidians. An FBI plane was taking infrared footage during the siege that can see warm and cool spots on the ground. But it's very difficult to tell what's actually going on based on the footage. But the footage shows what appears to be FBI agents outside the tanks and white flashes that could be gunfire. And when the FBI had their own experts look at the footage, they said the flashes aren't gunfire, but reflections from the sun. Really? Yeah, complete bullshit. I don't know about that. And this effect couldn't be replicated by documentary filmmakers. Two men can be seen coming out of the escape hatch of a tank and firing what looks like automatic weapons. There isn't any other effect that can be mistaken for sustained rapid fire. Other experts who analyze this footage believe the tanks were seen running over Davidians. 
but when pressured to talk publicly, they backed off these claims. One of the Davidian survivors wrote about what he saw, including watching a tank run over two men. He said the tank ripped off the first man's arm and part of his torso and cut off the second man's leg at the hip. These injuries actually matched what was found at the autopsies. The day after the assault, President Clinton spoke and said David Crush wanted to murder himself and his captors, and he called him a religious fanatic and said the Davidians set the fire on purpose in order to fulfill that suicide pact. I'll play a little bit of Bill Clinton's speech now. On February the 28th, four federal agents were killed in the line of duty trying to enforce the law against the Branch Davidian compound, which had illegally stockpiled weaponry and ammunition and placed innocent children at risk. Because the BATF operation had failed to meet its objective, a 51-day standoff ensued. The Federal Bureau of Investigation then made every reasonable effort to bring this perilous situation to an end without bloodshed and further loss of life. The Bureau's efforts were ultimately unavailing because the individual with whom they were dealing, David Koresh, was dangerous, irrational, and probably insane. The FBI had audio and video bugs in the compound and found no evidence that the Davidians had a suicide pact or had ever discussed mass suicide or murder. The surviving Davidians said they were happy that David was writing his manuscript so they could surrender, and they were excited to finally leave the compound. They had been using fuel for portable heaters, lights, and an emergency generator after the FBI cut off the electricity. Some audio from the bugs suggested that they might have been pouring out the fuel. They mentioned pouring something out, but they don't say fuel. They also talked about moving fuel away from the tanks, and in one clip, someone talked about lighting the fires. These snippets of conversations are suspicious, but inconclusive. The Davidians had plenty of guns to kill themselves and wouldn't need to set a fire. I mean, if they're really going to kill themselves, why not just take a gun and use that? Right. The autopsy showed that some of them did shoot themselves, possibly to avoid being burned alive after being trapped. Or they were just too injured and suffering from their injuries. Yeah, that was just like, there's no way I'm going to survive uh -huh. this, so why not end it now? The infrared footage also shows that multiple fires broke out at once, which suggests they could have been coordinated. Sounds pretty reasonable to me. Yeah. But the FBI justified a lot of their actions by arguing that the Davidians could have just come out of the building. But it's hard to imagine mothers with small kids rushing out toward armored tanks, knocking holes into the walls, and maybe even gunfire. Constant gunfire, though. I don't, I don't though. blame them. Like, And I don't believe anything the ATF was saying that they weren't shooting their guns at yeah. certain times. They were constantly firing at the compound. Like the Branch Davidians, they were hiding, laying on the floors in the compound yeah. because if they stood up, they would have been shot through the wall. Yeah. It was that bad. Plus the amount of tear gas sprayed into the compound, three days worth in just a few hours caused a ton of damage. Some of the Davidians couldn't breathe and their lungs and skin were actually burned. Tear gas causes nausea and disorientation and excessive exposure can make people unable to move and cause swelling that leads to asphyxiation and death. And obviously, this, the effects of tear gas are going to be way worse on young kids, and it should never be used in a confined area. Some Davidians were trapped by walls knocked down by the tanks. Women and kids were trapped in a concrete supply room where they were sheltering. At least two of the Davidians were run over by the tanks, and the others had no way of knowing whether or not this was on purpose. But by this point, the Davidians had no trust in the FBI. And honestly, I don't blame them. The few that did run out to escape the fire said later they assumed they would be immediately shot by agents and chose that quick death over being burned alive. Even if the Davidians did set the fire, it would have been done by just a few who made the decision in the moment. The most likely scenario is that the fire was caused by the destruction of the tanks and the fuel that was being spilt all over the place and the fact that they're shooting bullets at gasoline being dumped all over the place. I mean, it'd be very, very easy for a fire to start in this type of situation. For sure. The FBI denied using flammable tear gas, which is more likely to explode in a confined space, but there's literally video evidence of agents getting permission to use incendiary tear gas. So the tear gas, I mean, that highly concentrated tear gas in a confined area like that is like a, almost like a bomb in mm -hmm. a way. I mean, you get a spark in there, you get anything in there. Super flammable. It's going to go up. Yeah. So... And what's crazy is there's actually evidence of this. 
where agents are asking for and receiving permission to lob an incendiary tear gas canister at a concrete bunker. Here's a clip of that. It's absolutely crazy. Currently resupplying Charlie Washington. As relative safety, uh, utilizing the vehicle for cover and attempt to get to penetrate the uh, construction project. We're talking about the blast over top of the construction. And what's even more wild is that tear gas, I mean, is clearly a chemical weapon that was banned in warfare in 1925, but the U.S. government and law officials are still allowed to use it against American citizens. How crazy is that? And what's even wilder and just honestly sad about all this was that David's mother, Bonnie, had actually watched the final day of the Waco siege on TV and held out hope that David and her grandchildren would make it out alive. She was working as a pediatric nurse when she died. It actually took days to recover David Crush's body from the compound, and it had to be identified through x-rays and dental molds because it was that badly burned. I mean, this, this fire too is just like an incinerator. The fire was so hot that it just melted everything, including human, I mean, human remains. But after piecing together his shattered skull, the autopsy showed his cause of death was a gunshot wound in the center of his forehead, but they couldn't determine if it was self-inflicted. But David was 33 years old at the time of his death. The actions of the ATF and FBI were scrutinized by the media, the public, and other government officials, as well as surviving Davidians. The survivors questioned why agents would push psychological warfare tactics if they believed David was a radical cult leader. They believed agents were looking for an excuse to kill him and attack the group, and that's why they were provoking him. From the very start of the siege, the ATF agents came in hot. They never planned to properly serve the search warrant. And according to Operation Showtime, they plan to knock down the door and not knock on the door. Right. And another major point right here, if the ATF approached this whole situation in peace and not those, all those military vehicles, helicopters, like their aggressive stance, like was the pivot of this going all downhill. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, pretty much comes back to Dick Rogers. I mean, he yeah, just wanted, they just wanted like come in there and smoke him out and mm -hmm. force like forcibly remove david from there. yeah almost like this is some type of like terrorist operation in some type of war i mean this right. they made this a war zone yeah when this is a, a law enforcement operation like mm -hmm. in what world does this make sense for this this type of scenario especially when you have essentially hostages in a way you have kids yeah. you have children you have innocent people innocent inside, lives right and you still take this aggressive of, a, of an approach it's just absolutely insane yeah like we said earlier one of the other big questions of this whole thing was who shot first on that very first day if the agents served the search warrant by running toward the compound with guns drawn then the davidians may have been justified in defending themselves against this excessive force from a legal perspective but if the Davidians shot first, then the actions of the agents wouldn't be considered excessive. So the question of who fired first could be answered by looking at the metal door to the compound. The door was processed as evidence, but somehow this door disappeared. So it's hard to imagine the Davidians firing at a metal door from inside the compound because there would be a high chance of ricocheting bullets, which that makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, why the hell would they have shot first through the front door if you know, the whole point of it is to go knock on the door to, you know, serve this right. warrant. It, but yet there's bullets going through the door. Yeah. And even in the Waco series, it was an ATF officer who wasn't supposed to fire. Like they didn't have the green light yet, but he shot too soon. And once the Davidians saw that, they just came on. Yeah. It was game it was on. Like, yeah. Like, so, oh, you're going to fire at us? We'll fire at you. Right. So it does kind of seem to be an ATF officer accidentally fired first yeah yeah that's definitely one of the theories out yeah there. the atf documented what happened on video and through written records the videotape and multiple pages of these records however have disappeared the fbi improperly stored the bodies of the davidians and ordered investigators to wash and bleach all the evidence the atf also violated orders by executing the search even though they had lost the element of surprise because that was the whole thing the whole original plan is go like go element of surprise not like go to war with these guys and, you know, square off like they did. I mean, God. Yeah, and it defeated the whole purpose of having their undercover right. law enforcement in there. Right. Even, even he was like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Yeah. When they're driving down to the compound. He was trying to stop them the whole time. Yeah. You're like, what so, are you guys doing? Yeah. But ultimately, 11 Davidians were charged with murder and conspiracy 
for the four ATF agents killed in the gunfight. There were other charges related to unlawful possession and use of firearms and aiding and abetting the voluntary manslaughter of the agents. None of them were charged with arson because the FBI didn't provide any evidence that the Davidians started the fire. There you go. I mean, that's all you need to know right yeah. there. They didn't even charge them with arson. Four of them were acquitted on all charges and all of them were acquitted of the murder and conspiracy charges. The Supreme Court ended up reducing the sentences even further because of problems with the trial. The decision to end the siege was very controversial. Janet Reno was the prosecutor of the child abuse cases before being appointed attorney general. And when she was briefed on what was happening at Mount Carmel, someone in the FBI told her that they had proof David Koresh was beating babies. And this person repeated, he's really slapping babies around. Now it's interesting because there is a lot of allegations of child abuse. I, I do think David Koresh was most likely abusing children. I mean, we know he was sleeping with underage children, but I do, you know, from people that were in, in there with him, they said that the spanking thing, like they spanked so hard that kids were bleeding. I mean, there was definitely child abuse. However, no evidence of child abuse was ever uncovered. And the kids who survived were found to be well-adjusted, well-educated, and happy and healthy by Child Protection Services. So obviously, major point of contention there. Janet Reno also took responsibility for the mistakes made during the final attack and admitted there is no evidence of child abuse. So again, I guess it's, you know, whose word do you believe? A lengthy investigation found that the FBI agents didn't start the fire either. Incidents like the Waco siege led to the rise of extremist groups and anti-government radicals in the United States. Because as we've covered on this show on April 19th, 1995, at the two-year anniversary of the Waco siege, Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. And he claimed that this was revenge for the Waco siege and the siege at Ruby Ridge. And like we covered in that episode, Timothy McVeigh actually drove out to the Waco siege. And while he was there, he handed out pro-gun rights pamphlets. After the Waco siege ended so tragically, the FBI was faced with another long-term standoff in 1996 with the Montana Freeman, an anti-government group of Christian nationalists. But this time they worked together and were patient. And after 81 days, the siege ended with no deaths. So it can be done, clearly. After all this was over, the Branch Davidians mostly split up. And a former member who left when David Crush took over the group built a church on the Mount Carmel land. This group calls themselves the Branch, the Lord our righteousness. And they gather in the small one room chapel and have many more following the teachings online. There's also a memorial now on the property with all the names of the Branch Davidians who died in the Waco siege. But that's where we'll end this very tragic story. No matter what you think about David Koresh, obviously not a good guy. Clearly master manipulator, cult oh, yeah. leader, really let all this power he had go to his head. Yeah. Definitely lots of allegations of horrible things that he did to his members and children there. But at the end of the day, it's very, very clear that the government, the law enforcement agencies completely fucked up in this they situation. Did. I mean, they, they, there was no reason for this bloodshed and the burning of the compound. I mean, this was clearly handled wrong. I mean, yeah. I don't think you can really even dispute that this was handled in the right way. And I mean, just from their actions after the fact, it becomes very clear that, you know, it was became about covering up, right. Just trying know, their to mistakes sweep it under the doing rug. damage control. Yeah. But yeah. A lot of innocent people lost their lives that day. So, so just all around, it's just a horrible tragedy that regardless of what you believe about the Waco siege or Ruby Ridge for that matter, I mean, it's, it's clear that innocent people lost their lives when they didn't need to. I mean, children lost their lives, people who, good people, you know, just doing what they, they thought mm -hmm. they needed to do. I mean, I don't see why they couldn't have waited it out right? and, you know, took the peaceful approach seemed like not that hard honestly no. i think eventually you know david was gonna probably surrender and come out if you know if he got to you know spread his message and yeah what he was all about i think that would have been enough for him i don't think necessarily this was like a, a jonestown 2.0 situation with a you know like they were thinking clearly that this was going to end up in this mass suicide right you know event i mean is it possible sure but 
all all evidence points to most likely not. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm going to leave leave it today. Definitely want to know what you think about the Waco siege. What you think about David Koresh? Let us know in the comments. Also, make sure you're subscribed to the show on Apple Podcasts, and make sure you're following us on Spotify as well as on social media on Twitter, Instagram. We're at Lights Out Cast. But until next time, lights out, everyone.